Hello. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Perspectives in AI seminar. We are uh, starting now the, the Perspectives in AI seminar from the Center for Artificial Intelligence, C4AI. The C4AI uh, of uh, University of Sao Paulo used uh, sponsored by IBM and FAPES, is committed to state-of-the-art research in artificial intelligence, AI, exploring both foundational issues and uh, applied research, and also social impacts of AI applications. The Perspectives in AI seminar series uh, invites outstanding AI researchers to present and discuss state-of-the-art topics in AI. I would like to welcome Dr. Luis Lam here today from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul as our invited speaker in this seminar. Uh, uh, and follow and I really appreciate this opportunity to have a seminar presented by Dr. Lam at this C4AI event. Dr. Luis Lam is a full professor at the Federal University uh, Ufert. Uh, he is also a MIT Zoom visiting fellow and former Secretary of Innovation, Science and Technology of the state of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Uh, he was formerly dean of the Institute oh, yeah, of Informatics yeah, 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 of Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. Uh, uh, and he holds a PhD yeah. in computer yeah. science yeah. and AI from Imperial College of the his research interests include neural symbolic the integration of learning and reason. Uh, and um, uh, ethics in AI. He has several important and well-known publications in this field. He was co-organizer and speaker in several conferences and workshops on neurosymbolic learning and reasoning, including at AAAI, Ichikai, and Iberamia. It's an honor for us to receive he in our Perspectives in AI seminar series to talk about neurosymbolic AI building robust AI models. And in the name of the C4AI, I would like to thank you for accepting to present this seminar to us. Please, Dr. Lam, you can start your presentation. confirm that everything is okay and uh, thank you everyone at C4AI at USP it's a great honor to be here virtually let's say I'm not here physically I'm over there some way so um, I'm very happy that uh, today we can talk about uh, neurosymbolic AI and how this field can um, contribute to uh, or building robust AI technologies. I'm very happy to see that my friend Claudio Pignanis is here. IBM is doing a great job in uh, working on building more robust AI models. I have had the opportunity to interact with some researchers from uh, IBM Research. And here I also have the opportunity to talk to Fernando and everyone at C4AI about the need to build uh, more robust AI technologies. And uh, this is a very important topic. And uh, we know that AI nowadays is uh, a field that has gone beyond, well beyond technology. AI is headlines in the news. And uh, I always, sometimes I use this picture in my uh, presentations, the picture of the School of Athens, just to illustrate the value of knowledge, the value of uh, what you are building uh, today in our economics, what you are building in society. And this illustrates the role of philosophers, thinkers uh, in the Vatican. This is a picture by uh, Raphael, famous Raphael and uh, famous painter, Renaissance painter in Italy. And it illustrates in the School of Athens the importance of knowledge. And over here, what I'm going to try to do is to present a little bit about how this uh, field has evolved and uh, the importance of knowledge, the importance 
of integrating uh, learning and reasoning in building rich AI models, which is something that um, uh, richer AI models and richer technologies are beginning to understand the role, to understand the common role that uh, both fields have these days in AI uh, research. So I have to thank a lot of people, uh, some long-time collaborators, that's long-time collaborators that I have had in my life. Uh, some students, many of my students, I have learned a lot from way too many, many people and all of them deserve full recognition for helping me better understand what's going on in AI and how we can contribute to this field. We have produced, uh, let's say, it's a submitted paper, and it's a very overview paper about uh, the view. It's not highly technical, so the aim of this paper is not to show you the latest uh, deep learning technology, how this can become a technology, uh, has become an application, but the aim of this paper is to explain to you uh, how neurosymbolic uh, techniques can be understood and why this is going to impact AI in the coming future. But the questions that we are trying to solve with artificial intelligence, I always remind people that uh, our AI did not begin 10 years ago with deep learning, with neural networks. AI has a long history, at least since the 1950s. However, uh, the dream of building intelligent machines, of building machines that made calculations and could optimize our work, is even older. Philosophers have been debating this theme. Mathematicians have thought about it. Uh, Leibniz has thought about building uh, a calculator, a thinking machine. Other philosophers have uh, thought about this procedure. So uh, this is not a new topic in science. This is not a new topic in humanity, in the history of knowledge. However, digital machines using uh, technologies that led to what we have today. They started, let's say, in the 1950s, more or less, after the war. Of course, there was the effort during the war uh, led by figures like Alan Turing and other prominent researchers. And uh, already at that time, Turing was thinking if uh, it was possible uh, to build machines that in some day could think. He produced one of the first or probably one of the first modern philosophers, philosoph of AI papers in the in the journal of Mind in 1950s, a paper that everybody knows today because it, it introduces the so-called uh, Turing test. But neurosymbolic AI then uh, has this aim of, uh, of building a technical foundation for uh, integrating learning and reasoning, integrating logic and learning. And of course, this is, is, this is important because when we think in terms of cognitive abilities, any intelligent building has more than one cognitive ability, cognitive science, psychology, and uh, has explained it also for a long time. And it's, it's also very relevant to mention that already in the 50s, some, of course, um, very prominent researchers like uh, John von Neumann and many others that I will, I will show were already interested in to understand the logic of the so-called neural networks that have been proposed in the 1940s. Uh, this highly cited paper by uh, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts that introduced the idea of artificial neural networks was already a paper concerned with the logics that undergoes, that logic that is carried out, that the logic that underlies our reasoning. So this is it's a very point is a very important point that you have to make and von Neumann was also interested in how such engines such neural engines could some in some way perform some kind of intuitionistic or constructive logic for those who have not studied uh, logic in computer science or have not gone beyond classical logic intuitionistic reasoning it's a very very interesting approach to logical reasoning because everything has to be constructive everything has to be informally built by an algorithm. You do not assume the law of the ex excluded middle. It's a very uh, interesting approach, and this has a strong relationship with the way that we compute objects in mathematical logic and in computer science. And von Neumann was interested in both things, in neural networks and how neural networks can uh, simulate and can understand or perhaps can learn to perform constructive reasoning. And by the way, we, we did a paper on that in 2005, 
at uh, the NIPS conference, but uh, not many people paid attention to that. But it's interesting to see that von Neumann was already interested in that topic. So uh, we are in kind of good company over here, and perhaps we should have a look at this thing. Um, another point that I have to make here is that other prominent researchers like Stephen Kleen, Kleen is a very important person in the history of computer science. There is there, there are many concepts, foundational concepts that use every day in computer science, like, like regular expressions, regular languages and for those who think that this is not important remember unix unix made may, makes a lot of use of regular expressions uh, he was also a pioneer in recursive function theory or intuitionism on uh, fixed point calculations for that have been now widely used in the semantics of computer science uh, clean algebra clean star or clean closure that uh, it's used in for one who manipulates strings or monoids if one thinks in terms of a more uh, rigorous mathematical setting but he also also create the regular expressions if you read his original paper in the 1950s to express or represent Macaulay and Pitts neural network so there is another connection here that is highly relevant to neurosymbolic efforts and I'm pretty sure that over the next months or years people will, will rediscover these results and will publish novel results that relate to the current models that we have in artificial neural networks I also like to make reference to, to Macaulay and Pitts, because uh, Pitts, Walter Pitts, that was an influential logician, he was someone who was interested in the reasoning process. If you look at the Wikipedia entry from Macaulay and Pitts when I was preparing and revising this talk for today on the 22nd of uh, February, um, I, I made, made a question, made a point, I want to make a point here that for those who don't believe that integration is needed or integration is something that we should pursue, um, that the, the early pioneers of neural networks, the guys who published the first paper on artificial neural networks in 1943, Macaulay and Pitts, were already interested in how neural networks can perform logical reasoning. So much so that the title of the paper is called A Logical Calculus of Ideas Immanent in Nervous Activity. That's the, the, the title of perhaps the first neurosymbolic paper. So coming back now to more recent work, uh, I, I have made the point that uh, uh, the integration of logic and neural networks are something that already interested some of the pioneers in computer science. The point I want to make here is how the field has evolved over the last 20 years and why do we need now more robust AI models. In the early 2000s, uh, there were virtually no papers in the top AI conferences that make use of artificial neural networks. Uh, at that time, uh, of course, there were a few exceptions. They had uh, the, this paper from some of our friends from Germany on neurosymbolic AI and other papers that we published at uh, AAAI, but what was very hard, it was very uncommon to see at either AAAI or HKI, and sometimes uh, even at some new RIPS editions, uh, papers about neural networks. But then, just before the so-called deep learning revolution over the last decade, uh, in the second half of the first decade of the century, Jeff Hinton started to show that uh, the models that he used over several decades with some uh, little technical changes in activation functions or other ways of combining the layers of neural networks could achieve very interesting results. And then we had the so-called deep learning revolution. And one of the, the first papers, one of the papers that I like to, 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 to read from time to time is this paper on a fast learning algorithm for deep belief nets. He had worked on belief networks for uh, quite some time, and he showed that this technique of, uh, uh, of uh, using deep models could be very, very effective in several applications. And more recently, there has also been some uh, interest in uh, artificial intelligence models that uh, combine learning and reasoning, because people uh, realize that there are several uh, technical points or several application points in uh, neural networks and these points are related to the fact that it's very hard to explain reasoning processes in at, via artificial neural networks. Of course, it's, it's very convenient to use massive amount of data. It's very convenient to use in a number of applications that you know in, uh, in machine vision, in natural language processing, these la very large language models. But when one goes to machine common sense, to argumentation, to question answering systems, to human machine interaction, then things go a little bit fuzzy and things get a little bit harder to understand what's actually going on. So this led to a number of uh, symposia, seminar, debates on the future of AI and how to integrate different forms of reasoning and 
machine learning. Well, it was also important to notice that uh, one of the prominent uh, economists and one of the prominent cognitive psychologists, by the way, no, uh, Daniel Kahneman is not only an economist, but he's also a psychologist. He wrote this book on thinking fast and slow. And um, several people made the analogy of thinking fast and slow with the analogy of combining uh, machine learning and logical reasoning. Because of course, uh, when we are dealing with this fast, intuitive way of responding to day-to-day -day routine activities like opening a door, like uh, taking a shower, uh, like going to work. We don't even think about what we are doing. We have learned from past experience how to react in some situations that are extremely repetitive that happen in a routineous way. However, when we are confronted with new situations, like for instance, assume that a, a new country has, inv has invaded a neighbor, a peaceful neighbor, then we have to bring out the, the best of our uh, cognitive abilities to think deeply about how to react to such situations. So this involves a lot of logical reasoning. It's, of course, it's not just to take a huge amount of data and then out put a result out of a machine that will give you the best explanation for such a complex situation. This is, of course, is just a, a stretch of the argument that I'm making here, but I'm just illustrating the point that reasoning and learning are some abilities that we humans use on a day-to-day -day basis, and AI systems should also uh, consider this and to make them more effective. And so there have been several uh, debates, the AI debate number two, moving AI forward, where Daniel Kahneman also took part. There was a triple AI panel on neurosymbolic AI. There was an IBM seminar now in January on neurosymbolic AI. IBM, as I mentioned, is investing uh, several, uh, much many resources and involving a lot of people on this new line of uh, research that can lead to some interesting results as they have shown in some papers that they are producing over there. And uh, oh, another point uh, that I want to make is that um, the field is a field where you see several approaches to neurosymbolic AI. Although the, the, the community over the last 20 years was not such a large community, Henry Coates was capable of producing a taxonomy for uh, neurosymbolic AI in uh, his invited talk at IIII 2020, the last IIII conference before the pandemic was like uh, uh, in the first week of February, uh, or first or second week of February 2020, and two weeks later, the, 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 the world has, was shut down and all conferences became virtual. And then we learned how to use Zoom and other techniques to interact with each other. And so, and uh, Henry Coates produced this very interesting um, taxonomy of neurosymbolic systems, how you, one can classify the system, how these systems uh, relate to certain applications. And uh, I recommend that you read this paper because of his paper on or his talk or his slides give also a general technical overview how techniques for specific techniques for neural network learning and uh, knowledge representation reason can be combined. Um, another point I make here is that uh, after this great AI debate in December 2019, people started to pay attention because even because Yosha Benj and Gary Marcus made the point that um, Neurosymbolic AI could be uh, a possibility, could be a, a technical possibility or a field that would contribute a lot to building these robust AI models. Uh, also, we have seen recently uh, in the news over the last two years, uh, the, the push, uh, let's say, a push forward towards building more robust AI models. It's clear that if you are going to use AI, for instance, to make your investments using a combination of uh, massive data and some uh, blockchain technology for make your investments in cryptocurrency, or if AI is going to decide your medical treatment, or if AI is going to be your lawyer or someone who hires people to work in your company or will uh, will be the engine uh, underlying uh, autonomous vehicles. Of course, you need much more solid models. And so even the media, the, the specialized media has now uh, understand or understood the role of uh, uh, the need for better, better semantics, better semantic models, and formalized reasoning in artificial intelligence. Uh, I have mentioned already IBM, but also Microsoft Research and other companies are in, investing in neurosymbolic techniques, are investing in applications of neurosymbolic AI. If one looks at the web page of IBM Research, you, you see that they have a lot of publications on neurosymbolic AI. They have over uh, a, a number, of, a very interesting number of uh, projects 
projects going on with universities and joint research projects. But what they are trying to do and what is interesting to see is that usually what, what comes out of industry research labs is practical applications of technologies that end up in projects and then people get convinced that such, a, such an approach, such a scientific approach can, can be used in industrial applications. That's what, the, in the end of the day, what we want to do with our research results. We want to improve technology for, for the betterment of humanity, of course. So, can all these debates, all this fuzz, all this information that we are seeing in the media lead to better integration, lead to better science? Uh, this is the big question. Not only want to integrate it for the sake of uh, having different, uh, uh, different approaches in AI or to publish the results, what we actually want to do is to have better science, to have better technology and better solutions. And, um, I'm bringing here some of the things that I have already commented on uh, the work of uh, Daniel Kahneman. The System 1, System 2 analogy that have a long history in psychology. Let us remind us that uh, when Daniel Kahneman won the Turing Award for, for his work on, the, on behavioral economics, he had been investigating the behavior and the, the cognitive abilities and the reasoning of human beings for over four decades. So this work on building a solid model for human reasoning is something based on experimentation, on large-scale experiments that uh, Daniel Kahneman uh, and uh, Tversky did over four decades. And uh, what, the, what they concluded is that this analogy of having a fast intuitive parallel system and another system that is more reflexive, let us remind us of a complex situation that human decision makers have to take. For instance, when a country invades another peaceful country for some reason, we cannot react in a very fast intuitive way, not thinking about the consequences of our actions. This is exactly what system two, let's say, of an individual does. You have to react. When you're going to cross a street, you don't do that automatically. Imagine that you are in London, so people drive on the left or on the right, depending on the country, and then you came out from Italy, let's say you've never seen, uh, you've never been in London before, and then you are going to walk the street, you get hit by a car. So there are situations where, where reasoning is very, very important in um, in applications in AI, this is of course I just make an analogy here, but the point the point is that uh, this uh, this new school of AI or this the school of neural learning, uh, some of the people have put have made a, a very strong case that deep learning techniques and deep learning algorithms or deep learning applications is all that we need in AI and we don't need logical models. Of course, this is a, this argument that goes too far. In the history of science, what we have seen is that when one goes way beyond, let's see, what's actually uh, reasonable to expect from a, from a certain technique, one, one can see, one can uh, later on prove that uh, there is not only a hammer for all nails that we have on Earth. We have to see what's the best of uh, several possible worlds in terms of analyzing where science is going on. So the, the argument here is that uh, uh, is also interesting to note is that uh, we are borrowing results from cognitive psychology, that are borrowing results from, from economic sciences. And uh, what's really uh, going on here is that AI is becoming a science that is richer and richer uh, by interacting with these uh, prominent researchers uh, on a daily basis. And uh, another point that I, I want to make here is that in the history of artificial intelligence or in the history of computer science, uh, the symbolic school has played the, the, a prominent role, perhaps a, a major role, not, not perhaps, certainly a major role in the development of science and technology. Let us remind us that uh, one, of the, one of the early pioneers of artificial intelligence was, uh, uh, were uh, uh, Herbert Simon and Alan Newell. Let us remind ourselves that Herbert Simon was one of the proponents of the theory of bounded rationality, was also, an, as Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner, Winner and an ACM Turing Award winner. So Herbert Simon belonged to the school of the so-called symbolists, whereas more recently, the school uh, led by Benjamin, uh, by Yasha Benjamin, Jeff Hinton, uh, is the so-called connectionist schools that involves a, a very large, a way larger community of neural networks or neural learning researchers or connectionist uh, learners or deep learning researchers. That is the school that has shown us that artificial Neural networks are very effective in, in several applications.
applications that I don't even need to comment over here. And there are other people like uh, Leslie Valiant and Jude Poor uh, that have, some, in a, some way, uh, uh, an approach that tries to conciliate those two schools. Uh, over the last uh, 30 years, Les Valiant has put forward a, an agenda for learning to reason in a sound way. And if you know Les Valiant was, was perhaps uh, the most influential computational learning theory that we have in, in uh, artificial intelligence, he's the proposed of the pack learning uh, method and pack learning, pack learnability. He won a Turing Award for several of his contributions to computer science, but uh, Les Valiant is someone who also came from the theoretical computer science community, studied reasoning and the complexities of reasoning and complexity of computational algorithms that we have. And in order to build a sound reasoning or sound learning system, he also claims that we need um, to have robust reasoning systems integrated with a connectionist machine. Jude Pearl, of course, the pioneer of uh, causal and Bayesian methods in artificial intelligence and in machine learning and another is another person who also believes and who has also claimed in his talks and his um, public speech uh, over the uh, last two years that we need to conciliate these schools because we can benefit then from all the 2,000 years of research in logic or the last 200 years of research in Bayesian reasoning, causality and probability. And this can bring, of course, contributions to the development of, of sounder or more sound AI technologies. So going more specifically to the kind of work that um, I did or that my uh, my friends, collaborators and I did together, uh, the inspiration to do our work is to build uh, systems that can learn from the experience and can reason about what has been learned, learned from an uncertain environment. Ideally, we, we are trying to build models for an open environment where agents absorb new and new information, where they have to revise their beliefs, they have to revise their understanding about the world, they have to revise the information that the sensors that they have from the world provides them. So you can think about a robot, you can think about any systems that collects information in a massive scale, uh, in the world, and there are plenty of systems in AI that do that uh, these days. And uh, the motivation is clear that there is a there is there is a challenge, or there are many challenges to learn and on how to build learning systems uh, that uh, acquire information from the environment or in the environment. Think, for instance, the, the terms of uh, in terms of time. Uh, think in terms of uh, how much the world situation has changed over the last 24 hours. Think if you have a massive amount of data on the behavior of, um, of the geopolitical situation over the last years, and this massive amount of data was uh, input to a, to a neural network system, let's say, and think if uh, this system could produce a result predicting or seeing what was going on, or what what was going to ha gonna happen over the last 24 hours. What I want to make here is to make the point that the world is way more complex than some some people think it is, and it's way more complex than um, the possibility of using a single technique to model aspects of the world. So we have to think about certain certain uh, challenges that the world presents to ourselves, that the environment presents to ourselves. Of course, we have to reason about common sense reasoning, common sense knowledge. We have to reason about space, time, uncertainties, probabilities, new beliefs, new forms of, uh, of data, new kinds of data that we are confronted every day. And uh, the way to integrate reasoning and uh, computation and the, the idea of reasoning and computation, let us not forget, the first machines, the first computers were used to, to, take the, 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 to take the place of people who actually did computation using their brains and their pencils uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a daily basis. And the, the way to integrate reason and learning, of course, we need to, to, to look at the best techniques that we have in, in logical systems and the best techniques that we have in machine learning so that we can perhaps build these richer AI systems. And of course, we have to think also that that when when is building a reasoning system, there are different forms of reasoning. You have inductive reasoning, you have deductive reasoning, you have abductive reasoning, you have probabilistic reasoning. So there are many, many forms of reasoning that need to be exploited. And it's not reasonable to, to expect that a single learning system based on a single technique will be able to express 
all forms of the complexities of reasoning that uh, intelligent agents or even artificial agents can uh, be endowed with in the real world. So the point here is that also we have to emphasize that reasoning can be very hard. Uh, all the theory of NP completeness derived from very, 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 very simple uh, logical problem, that's the problem of satisfiability, how to build an algorithm that would be extremely efficient and would be capable of identifying a satisfiable formula in large amounts of large number of formula. Of course, this led to the theory of NP completeness and today to solve the question whether or not P equals NP can give you at least a million dollars. There's even a prize for that and all the results that we have in theoretical computer science, complexity theory uh, have been derived. Uh, certainly many of them related to this very complex question related to logical reasoning and formalizing the computational setting. So. Uh, another point that I want to make here is that there are several uh, new approaches that have been proposed to explain, understand, and reason about uh, complex environments. This is the, the aim of uh, neurosymbolic AI. One of the approaches is the approach uh, captained and led by researchers from IBM that's called neurological neural networks. It's, it's interesting because recently this approach has been uh, extended with um, uh, and a, a form of representation uh, that takes into account logic programming. So the, the, the way that they are integrating logical neural networks is a way that's similar to what began in the 1990s. It's not a problem at all. It's not a problem at all. Let us remind us that uh, from the original neural network models that Jeff Hinton and many in the school uh, of neural networks like Ian LeCun or Yosha Benjo, many of the models that they proposed, they, they suffered very small modifications and by some technical, uh, for some simple technical modifications, they achieved the results that we have these days. So by looking back what, what, to what happened over the last 20 years, some very interesting models are being proposed. And as the school of the, our friends in Italy of logic explained neural networks show, uh, what we can achieve by integrating logic and reason is better explainability. We can also build a, um, a system that's interpretable, that, that has a sound semantics by construction, as we do in logical systems. In logic, we have some, some so-called meta properties that include soundness, uh, completeness, and decidability, and so on. And if, then you can build a system that can reason and learn by construction in a sound way, or you can try and do a logical explanation or an explanation of a system or an existing system using some technique needs to extract the knowledge and to represent it in a, in a proper language. So this is also an interesting point to make, uh, this, this distinction between interpretable and explainable systems. So explainability is a posteriori explanation, a posteriori interpretation that you give to a system, whereas an interpretable system is something that is done uh, by construction, by some logical properties that a system enjoys or not. Um, of course, there has been also work on, uh, on uh, schools that connect uh, uh, tensor networks and logical representation. There is this work by uh, Badredini, Garces, Serafini, and Michael Spranger on logic tensor networks that also use use is now a fuzzy representation of uh, relational reasoning or first order reasoning. And there are also some works that we are looking at at the moment is, is how to understand Boolean function learnability on deep neural networks. And this work that we have started to do over the last year is something that is related in a way to PAC learnability. So PAC learnability explains to you what's learnable uh, in certain in certain theoretical settings. What we want to do here is to understand by using some Boolean function uh, learnability techniques, what actually, in a sense, deep neural networks are from a computational point of view. I have not seen an explanation uh, along these lines, an explanation that would be accepted by computational learning theories so far. There has been some interesting works, but you don't have a theoretical framework for deep learning as you have, for instance, for part learning that uh, Les Valiant has uh, developed over the years. So I, I think there is some interesting avenues of research uh, to, have a, to have a look at. We did some uh, initial experiments and in some initial work in 2020, 2021. We are now in, improving this paper. And this is a paper that, is, that started from a conversation that I had with Moshe Vardy in 2020 about uh, the limits of deep, deep neural networks and how deep neural networks could be 
uh, put into a, a sound framework that could be explainable or could be understood in the same way or in an analog analogous way as Spark Learning does for other learning systems. Uh, however, uh, this is not the only work that we have uh, in neurosymbolic AI, of course. I have commented a little bit about the works that have been more prominent over the last years, but this idea is very, is very, is very, is uh, in a way has been uh, stimulated researchers for a long time. Uh, I remind you here again, before I go to, to the next slide, that McCulloch and Pitts already were interested in uh, to understand what was the logical calculus of, uh, of neural networks. Uh, and they developed an artificial model of, of uh, neural networks, of course. And the first thing that they, they thought was, well, let's see how humans or how neural networks perform logical reasoning. Um, I remind uh, you again that in the paper by Stephen Klein, uh, the logician who, 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 who gave us a lot of results that are important even for those who don't like theory but like the Linux and Unix systems, he gave us regular expressions, for instance. Um, uh, Stephen Klein was also interested in representing and understanding what kind of computation, what kind of automata are neural networks. So. It's interesting to note that some of the questions in science, they, they, they go back and forth, they move in this small uh, temporal window that we have seen over the last 60 years. And sometimes in science, we kind of overestimate the amount of time that we have dedicated to research. Uh, and the best, one of the best examples that we have is, is absolutely uh, deep neural networks. Uh, neural networks uh, came to prominence in the late 80s, in the very early 90s. Then we had like a, a neural network winter, not an AI winter, but like, let's say a neural network winter of uh, almost 15 years. And now 30 years after uh, the boom of the 1980s, neural networks are the hottest topic that we have in artificial intelligence. And it's probably the reason why we have uh, the Center for AI at, at, uh, at USP, why we ha we're having in this talk, this conversation, and why people are getting paid like half a million dollars uh, to be a programmer or an AI programmer at a big tech corporation these days. And um, so uh, the, the, the point here is, uh, is again, to emphasize the need for building uh, richer forms of uh, machine learning and reasoning in an integrated way. And of course, to produce uh, systems that are robust. And uh, since this talk is an overview of neurosymbolic AI, I want to remind us and uh, remind ourselves that this field has been uh, keep active, uh, is active over the last 20 years. There has been a, a small community. I saw that Sherson Zaverusha was here at the beginning of the presentation. I don't know if he's still in the audience. Gerson is an old time friend. He was one of the pioneers of the field in Brazil. And this community had like 25, 40, 50 people working on keeping, let's say, the fire on over the last 20 years. And then we had this, uh, this, this boom of interest in building more robust AI systems and systems that would go beyond deep learning, would, would go beyond producing results that had their merit, that were outstanding, that got AI very prominent, in, even in the media, on the big stage, on television, or if the, anyone still watches TV these days, and uh, all social networks. And AI became famous because of deep learning, because of artificial neural networks, that people denied their importance in the late 90s, let us remind ourselves. And now we have this community that, that has uh, kept this, this, this um, the subject alive over the last 20 years and they deserve our recognition. So uh, let us let us go into more detail about the work that I have done over here. Uh, our work is foundational, is based on the logical formalization of reasoning and we use, uh, it's our belief that the best uh, the best way to represent the reasoning processes is using uh, computational logic formalism that have been developed over the last 30 years in computer science. We also have had applications in software engineering, in training and assessment in simulators, in robotics, in visual intelligence, in natural language processing these days. We have seen that uh, the natural language community is pretty much interested in neurosymbolic AI because this can provide the best way 
to understand the semantics, you know, to provide the semantics for natural language processing systems that are based on artificial neural networks, be it a transformer model or a graph neural network model or any other model that proves effective in practice. So the main idea here, and this is and this is also uh, in honor of our friend Gerson, who was here, one of the, pro the first systems in the 1990s was the CLP system that, that integrated um, inductive learning and connectionist models, inductive learning uh, using inductive logic logic programming for knowledge representation and use some very some simple um artificial neural network models, but the important result is not the technical stuff here in terms of what kind of neural networks that they use. The, the, the interesting thing is that they, they were able to prove that certain models of artificial neural networks can compute the fixed point semantics, i.e. the result of a logic program. And since Prolog is one of the favorite languages for knowledge representation and reasoning in AI, they showed how to build a connection between two different schools in a system that had a very sound semantics and could be used in applications. Um, this system was also related to other systems. One of them is the system known as KBAN, was the first system that allowed for learning with background knowledge in neural networks and also knowledge extraction. So it was a very experimental system developed by the group of Jude Shavlik in, uh, in, in the US here. In in, uh, in Wisconsin. We also had the results from uh, Stefan Holdobler and the, the German school that uh, was interested in building uh, parallel computational models for logic programming. It's a system that uh, was proposed in the beginning of the 1990s that was also contributed to the development of the field. And the one thing that's important here is that uh, since the beginning, at least the systems of uh, uh, the systems that Professor, Professor Gerson Javerusha and many of the German pioneers and Jude Schavlik and mainly the school that Gerson was uh, leading, let's say, the very small group that he led in, in Rio, he has a lot of merit for that. Gerson was someone who was very interested in preserving the the soundness of their learning procedures and producing reasoning systems that would show the same results that a logical system uh, produced in a symbolic way. I, I, I tend to agree with this school because when you came from the logic school, you cannot, let's say, uh, give away with some principles, principles of soundness or principles of completeness. However, completeness is something that is not achievable, I would say, in open systems, because you get more and more information all the time. You can achieve soundness, but not necessarily completeness. And soundness is a good enough property that can lead you to interpretable, explainable, and safer models and safer AI technology. But this deserves like a, uh, an hour conversation about the importance of soundness in artificial intelligence and in logical reasoning. Um, also, some, uh, some, uh, some, something related to the evolution of the field. In the 1980s, in 1988, the, the cognitive, sci the cognitive uh, psychologist, the, the cognitive scientist, Paul Smolensky, who is a professor at Johns Hopkins University. Everyone has heard now of Johns Hopkins University, was the first research university in the United States, right? Uh, when, when one thinks in terms of universities, the first university uh, construct by construction, as we say in logical systems, constructed to be a a research university was Johns Hopkins. It, of course, it was uh, more focused on uh, the medical sciences. It was be it became very well known outside the academic world during the pandemic, during the COVID pandemic, given the, all the results and data that they produced to analyze the pandemic. Paul Smolensky wrote a paper on the proper treatment of connectionism, a very influential paper in behavior and brain sciences and, uh, during the, the hype of uh, connectionist models in AI in the 1980s. And John McCarthy at the time provided some challenging observations. He claimed that uh, neural network models could only deal with propositional reasoning. Even in an empirical sense of, of view, and I hope that Sherson agrees with me now, uh, neural networks have gone well beyond propositional reasoning. We cannot say that what neural networks are producing these days, even from the data, from mass amount of data, is, is, uh, or is um, propositional reason. We have seen that neural networks are capable of, of enlisting and identifying very complex relations between objects. So we have gone away already beyond propositional reasoning in artificial neural networks. Of course, we don't have the best explanation, the best formalized application about what's going on. And this is what uh, neurosymbolic AI models want to do. It's interesting to note that Jeff Hinton already in the early 90s, he, he understood the importance of uh, connection in symbol processing. There was an, uh, a special issue of artificial intelligence journal uh, 32 years ago it's unbelievable in 1990 about how uh, the, the two schools could be integrated then we had 
of course, the, the work done by uh, several pioneers that I already mentioned during the 90s, the group of Jude Schavlik, the group of, of Stefan Hodobler in Germany, and also the work that was uh, the work by Arthur Garcias that he started with Sherson and then finished at uh, Imperial College doing his PhD studies that led to an extension CLP systems, but our motivation here is uh, to go beyond classical reasoning, classical logic, the typical logic that one learns, um, I would say at school, but we don't study study logic at school anymore, and during the 1960s and 70s people used to school to study logic at school, but we don't study logic anymore at school, perhaps uh, we should do that. And uh, what we want to do is to go beyond uh, classical logic because there are several forms of reasoning that artificial agents and computing systems have to deal on a daily basis. And so uh, during my PhD studies, I have to confess that uh, one of the books, one of the books that I had in my table and, and I read like 300 times each page of the book was this famous book on reasoning about uh, multi in reasoning in, in distributed environments published by very influential researchers, uh, Ron Fagin, uh, Joseph Halpern, Joran Moses, and our friend Moshe Vardy on reason about knowledge. This book has over 5,000 citations these days. And what this book did was it formalized how reasoning how cooperation, how distributed reason reasoning happens, not only in computer science, in the distributed systems, but also in multi-agent artificial intelligence systems. And what we realize is that um, if you want to build a neurosymbolic system, an AI system that learns to reason, it has to learn about several forms of reasoning not only propositional reasoning, not only predicate reasoning or relational reasoning that we see in school or that we used to see in school. And one of the first experiments that we did, one of the first ideas that we had was to, to represent uh, model logics. Model logic is, in, is interesting because it's a rich system that uh, is based on, uh, on a, initially on a cryptic semantics and, and uh, so Kripke de de developed Kripke semantics when he was still a teenager. Let us, I always, I am mean, always reminded of that. And um, it's also interesting that uh, model logics has, has several ways of expressing the modalities of reasoning, like temporal reasoning, uh, like constructive reasoning in intuitionistic model logics, and other ways of um, representing certain very important aspects that uh, artificial agents or even natural agents can express in, the, in their day-to-day -day lives. It's also, it's also very used to model reasoning about uncertainty. It's, approach, it's an approach that Joe Halpern from Cornell University uses. He uses model logic to reason about uncertainty and probabilities. And it's also uh, interesting that model logic go beyond propositional logic. You can express uh, in, a, in a certain way uh, relations uh, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a kind of a restricted fragment of first order logic that in a sense is very expressible and corresponds to certain interesting properties of computational uh, objects and computational functions. And uh, the idea that we had then was to, to see if one thinks in terms of uh, of artificial neural networks and try to visualize to make a representation of the abstract in a visual way is that was we we saw the neurons or the artificial neural networks or the neural networks uh, that were built uh, as possible worlds there is this idea in uh, model logic and in temporal logic of, of uh, representing the models or representing the semantics of temporal logics as possible states in branching time. For instance, there are several temporal logics that exploit branching time possibilities. And that this is the reason why temporal logics are so effective in uh, building tools such as model checkers and other tools for software engineering. And that, that, that also became the standard in the, in the semiconductor industry. There is no way today that it's possible to build a complex chip and not use model checking to verify if the chip corresponds to the specifications that have been drawn by the engineers. And uh, the, the, the insight that we had here was that uh, artificial neural networks could be seen as possible worlds. And as you combine and build these ensembles, and these hierarchies of neural networks that remind us of the hierarchies that we have in uh, 
hierarchies that we have in deep learning, we could see a way of representing temporal reasoning or the models of temporal reasoning in an artificial neural network setting. And then we developed this framework called connectionist model logic that was, of course, tested and used in applications inspired in the book and the test bets that we had uh, in the book Reasoning About Knowledge that were test beds used, widely used in distributed computing, widely used in uh, widely used in, in knowledge representation in distributed systems, in multi-agent systems in several domains. And we were able to show that uh, we could then have, have an effective integration between uh, learning systems and temporal logic. We could represent uh, some extensions of logic programming with model operators in artificial neural networks. And we could even compute the fixed point semantics of some connectionist uh, model logic programs, uh, which means that the extensions of prolog with model operators could be represented and learned by neural network models. So in this way, you had, of course, some technical details that I won't give you here. They are only in the papers. I could stay hours uh, showing you how to connect or how to calculate, calculate the thresholds or activation functions or biases of the neural networks, but that, that's not the point of the talk here the point the point of the talk here is to show that these neural network ensembles can correspond to possible worlds and by doing this using this intuition you can then build the neural networks uh, to compute the typical uh, reasoning procedures using model logic and then you can also learn the procedures uh, to reason about distributed challenges distributed uh, test beds in uh, ai systems that we have we have to confront uh, daily when building uh, this model us. And then you are going to say, well, this is very theoretical. Yes, it's theoretical, but let us not forget that uh, everyone who has developed a system where you need synchronization is actually solving in several points of the system some of those puzzles, for instance, the, 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 the synchronization puzzles and the temporal synchronization puzzles like that Dijkstra posed in some of his papers, including the dining philosopher's uh, problems or, 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 or several puzzles that happen in science and computer programming that can be used as test bed here to analyze if our system correspond and are capable to solve some of the benchmarks that are proposed or the test beds that these puzzles offer to us. And the interesting result here is that we can build then neural networks that for, for uh, certain classes of model or temporal logic programs, um, if we build these neural networks, we are capable to show that uh, these neural networks can compute the result. In the end of the day, it means that they can correspond to the semantics of the expected program that represents uh, the knowledge that's involved in certain distributed problems that we are solving using temporal reasoning and model reasoning or reasoning about knowledge in artificial neural network setting. The idea that we also pose here is an overall idea that uh, Today, you have seen several debates on, uh, on the topic, is that uh, it's very clear to us that knowledge of agents, knowledge of uh, uh, even the, the, the sets that we have about the world, they evolve in time. However, this question about knowledge evolving in time is something that's not very well solved so far. We are dealing with, for instance, when you have a very large language model, all, all the queries, let's say, is to where that we are querying uh, a large language model by hypothesis. Of course, it doesn't make that much sense using SQL or SQL to, to, to make some inference about the, the current state of affairs. What you are going to have is a kind of static inference about a massive amount of data, a massive amount of data describing certain aspects of our world. However, this is not catering perfectly to the temporal evolution that have in time. Again, let us use the same example that I used in the beginning of the talk. Think about uh, a situation where you have like massive amount of data and you have uh, um, a learning system that's, uh, that, that, that is used to predict uh, the future of uh, geopolitics in the world. Could this system have predicted what happened from yesterday to today? I don't know. I certainly don't know, and I am not expecting that. Of course, you need much more sophisticated systems based on logical inference, based on all of data, and human input to make this kind of decision. This is the point about combining techniques to, to reach AI systems and more robust AI systems. So, and people say, well, does this thing about neural networks and temporal reasoning, connectionist model logic, 
connections temporologic, this thing that we have told, have any kind of application? Yes, it does. We had a student about 10 years ago in a pioneering work, way ahead of time. This work today would be uh, a hit in software engineering conference, I believe. Uh, Rafael Borges developed a thesis at uh, City University, co-advised co by, by uh, Arthur Garces and myself. He was a former MSc student uh, in Porto Alegre. He now works as a, as a machine learning uh, engineer at uh, HP. Rafael developed a system that integrated uh, a learning engine to a uh, model checker in software engineering. What, what did we do with that? Well, from an initial specification of a software engineering model uh, written, let's say, in a temporal language that could be represented either as a temporal logic program or as uh, the language of the, of the model checker, well, using this, this language to express the initial model, if you have used a, a, a model checker, what it does to you is, from an initial description, it gives you counter examples of what's not very good in your specification in the model of the system. And the insight that we had here, well, let's use the counter examples to refine the initial model using machine learning using this neurosymbolic technique. And uh, we are very happy that the system that uh, used this um, as input, these counterexamples in the what we called an adaptation engine. An adaptation engine is, is actually a simple machine learning, simple neurosymbolic model to learn from these counterexamples. And this would provide then the system, the module checker, with an improved model that would be much more effective than to expect that a software engineer by hand would change the model from the counterexamples. So this, in, in a way, this automatizes, this automates a very important property, a very important um, characteristics of software. I think uh, we have some connection problems. We we'll wait uh, a little bit uh, to see if uh, we establish the connection with Luis Lam. I hope it's not a Russian attack to MIT. Please uh, stay in the our seminar for a little bit more while we wait for a connection. I think we have a very interesting questions to discuss uh, with Dr. Lamb about uh, neurosymbolic systems. And also, if you have uh, any question, please put the, the questions in the chat box of YouTube. Uh, so we can discuss about that uh, as soon as we get recovered from this little problem. I'm sure you have uh, a lot of uh, questions and comments uh, in this very interesting presentation from Dr. Lam. Oi. Hello. Okay, uh, we are back. Some people, 
Yeah, some people didn't like what I said about the, the example, real world example, so they shut me down. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know if it's a Russian attack to MIT. Or... Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. They didn't like what I said about the, the example, so but it was a hypothesis. I didn't mention any any name, so let's go on. Okay. okay. Where, where did they do where, what was the last slide that you saw? Okay, uh, I, I promise to be faster now. Okay. Uh, learning and adaptive requirements from. Birth. Okay, w was that one? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we, let. We are, uh, we are running out of time, I know. Okay. So, okay. So, going back to this slide, sorry, there has been some glitch yeah. here in the in the internet. Even in the Boston area, there are problems in the internet. So, um, what I was saying is that this approach can be used in several applications in software engineering and can be used even in the process of automating some steps, some important steps in software development and related to verification. This has also been seen as important uh, by a, in a paper by David Harrell at IIII 2019, where he used a similar approach to compose specifications with machine learning and search for solutions. So finally, I will get up to some of the technical challenges that we have. Uh, one of the challenges, one of the interesting approaches and interesting uh, works that we, we still have to do in AI is to explain what's going on in uh, those large scale neural networks. And what we suggest is that one can use uh, logical relations or can use the language of first order logic or higher order uh, knowledge extraction from these very large neural networks that we are using. But one can explain these models in a sound and efficient way so that one can uh, have better explanations, formalized explanations. That's the point I made along uh, the talk. Another point that uh, we have to have a look at is that, of course, uh, when you are dealing with this massive amount of data and you want to explain uh, common sense reasoning, you have to think also about the combinatorial explosion that you might confront when you are dealing with complex relations and complex connections between uh, multiple uh, multiple agents generating knowledge. We have produced some uh, results related to foundational results about uh, learning NP, NP hard problems and P complete problems. We did some experiments of satisfiability with the, uh, uh, the traveling salesman person, the graph coloring problem as well over the last years. And this is a point that Henry Kautz made in his taxonomy of neurosymbolic AI that uh, looking at these very foundational problems is also very important for a uh, deep learning system. Another point I want to make is about uh, uh, the relationship between humans and machines, uh, humans and AI systems. When we are building uh, systems that uh, take part of our daily lives, Okay, again, we had another problem, a connection problem. I hope we can uh, return the connection with uh, Louis Lamb uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, we we are back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You can yeah. proceed. <laughs> Let me see. I'm gonna try and finish before it uh, <laughs> fails again, okay? No okay. Start to finish before uh, um can you see my uh... Oh, my goodness. Uh, 
Okay, I'm trying to, to share the screen again, Fernando, in just a second. Um, just a second. Again, 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 again. Okay. <laughs> So we have a problem again, and uh, as uh, Claudio Pianis, that uh, probably is following us, uh, asked to the our invited uh, about the, the the effects of the pandemic. One of those is that. We are not uh, live uh, in person in a meeting and this pose this kind of problems. Okay, okay. I'm trying to, I'm trying to finish. I'm trying to finish. I try and finish. Okay, I'm, I apologize for the poor connection, but uh, you know, okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. This is I don't know what's... We have sometimes, no problem. So I'll try and finish here, so... Yeah. I hope we can have a workshop uh, in person soon. Yeah, the I hope uh, I have. Yeah. Together with a coffee break. And <laughs> yeah. So I was in one of the last slides. I'm going to finish here and I have to apologize. Well, I have to apologize. I don't know what happened in the network here. It's supposed never to fail. And, uh, to never fail in Boston. Let's see how it goes. So um, I'm sharing my screen. Let's see. Okay, it's gonna show you in a few seconds. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, some of the challenges that we have are related to human network communication, how we interact with artificial agents and artificial technologies, AI technologies, and in order to to assure people that what they are getting in terms of uh, interaction in terms of using say a language or natural language for communication is a secure protocol where we can assure and we can ensure that uh, the output of large language models or of uh, multi-agent systems that communicate with ourselves will provide answers that are sound and that are ground on truth information on, on truthful information and on solid database that have been whose inference or that and on, over which the inferences of ai uh, are executed and run using sound techniques okay but this of course uh, building ai systems that uh, understand and that are sound and robust is what brings us today is a, is a recurring recurring theme in the current AI debate. So finally, uh, I want just to leave you with some of the literature over the last uh, 20 years. There have been some surveys published that uh, give you an overview of uh, how the field is. One of the first surveys in 2005, uh, but there have been a lot of developments over 
of the last decades, uh, some of the first works on epistemic and temporal reasoning and model reasoning were, we developed in the early 2000s, the first decade, about 15 years ago. Uh, some important paper on representational learning that's related to the aims of neurosymbolic AI has been published even, even by Yosha Benjamin and Daniel Lecun. Uh, we wrote a book that uh, summarizes and gives you formalized ways of representing uh, knowledge and reasoning in artificial neural networks. Uh, we approach several forms of cognitive reasoning in this book called Neurosymbolic Cognitive Reasoning. Uh, we also had some uh, uh, recent, more recent surveys on the, on the methodologies of uh, artificial intelligence that uh, consider Neurosymbolic AI as a promising approach. We also published a paper that relates uh, the School of Graph Neural Networks, one of the models pioneered by our friend Marco Gori in 2005, and that today is one of the most prominent models that we have in artificial neural networks for learning in language settings and even in visual understanding, visual comprehension. So I believe that uh, uh, this information can help you to better understand what's going on in terms of the state of the art. And these last papers that I present here uh, also provide you with some uh, recent uh, uh, results from the research community that may be promising over the next decades. Okay, so thank you very much for your patience. I always remind myself that we have to be uh, very cautious and very humble in science, and I always listen to people who have proven results and read their, their work. So, and I finalize with these two quotes, one by Michael Rabin, one by John McCarthy, who said that uh, uh, general intelligence or AI systems certainly need an outer structure of common sense knowledge and reasoning, otherwise we cannot be, we will not be able to interact as humans with these technologies, using our language and using our cognition. And another important point to understand, in a way, what is computer science and what computer science is delivering to us, is that uh, our field, computer science, is still in an embryonic stage. And it's really great that we haven't been around for 2,000 years. We are in a stage today we are seeing very very important results happening in the front of our eyes and the results that ai and deep learning have shown us over the last 15 years are a proof of uh, this statement by michael rabin who of course was a turing award winner and a very prominent research in computer science so thank you very much for your patience sorry for the network glitches i hope that uh, uh next time we don't have this kind of uh, this kind of problem. Thank you so much, Fernando. Thank you very much, uh, Linda, for your presentation. That was very interesting and complete, full, and with full of reference from the past, the present, and the challenges in this field that it's uh, so important to artificial intelligence. Uh, I work also in this uh, field of uh, neurosymbolic systems, and uh, I'm sure that. Uh, uh, in order to achieve a better uh, artificial intelligence uh, results, we need to, to work with uh, this integration from neural and symbolic systems to achieve better results. So I will start with a question that is uh, really related with uh, what you presented in your last slide and uh, during your presentation, that is, what do you think about using natural language, as humans do, to extract, explain, and also transfer knowledge between neural and symbolic systems? Uh, when I talk about that, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is why uh, I saw two ways to, to work with uh, symbolic uh, systems. One, it's uh, formal, uh, using formal methods, uh, first order logic, higher order logic, temporal logic, uh, as you presented, a uh, model checker, in order to um, learn with constraints or with uh, a, a, a very verifiable very system that you can check the results. It's one way. But there is another way to work that it's uh, more human when you have approximative knowledge and uh, 
uh, the, the natural language, also the fuzzy logic, uh, fuzzy sets and uh, fuzzy terms uh, and expressions, uh, it's a way to, to, to express this fuzziness of uh, knowledge representation. So what do you think about uh, natural language as a way to, to express, uh, extract, or transfer knowledge? Well, that's, um, let's say that's the aim in the end of, um, let's say, natural language uh, research and AI is to be able to use our own language as the means of communication with uh, artificial systems, with computing systems. Um, however, uh, since this is a huge challenge, uh, of course, we haven't been able to reach it yet. As I mentioned, the, the, the greatest developments that we have seen in AI over the last uh, two or three years, let's say, if I had to pick like uh, one or two, I would certainly pick um, the, the, the protein structure prediction like uh, AlphaFold did. That's a very important achievement in terms of showing that this technology will be able to contribute to medicine, to biotechnology. To, to solving uh, health problems. That's a, a great advancement that we had. But from a more, more technical point of view, I would say that natural language, uh, understanding natural language processing is uh, the most exciting field that we have. Why? Uh, for, for many, many, many years, our focus in AI or in computer vision had, uh, let's say, precedence in research. But today, what we have seen with these very large language models is that uh, the day we that we have, let's say, computers that can produce texts, that can interpret information uh, in books, journals, in large databases, in the same way that a specialist can, uh, that would be such a, that will be a huge achievement. I mean, um, I'm not saying about uh, signal processing, about uh, uh, pretending that I am a computer speaking like Fernando Zora, I'm thinking about how to provide uh, proper language uh, modeling and interpretation um, of what we have, uh, of the way that humans do about language, about the, the, the subtleties, about uh, uh, the semantics of, uh, about the intended semantics of the speaker. So uh, this, this is much more of uh, a grand object objective of AI than some of uh, some kind of yes no question is like having let's say in software engineering uh, not the need to program anymore that the way that we can express our specifications to a system using natural language without recurring to a formalized language that makes uh, the translation a two-step uh, process over here uh, when we have natural language, of course, we will be able to explain to computers the way that uh, we reason about the situation, but we are, I'm afraid, still uh, a bit far from this uh, grand objective of AI. So in this sense, I see natural language as a very exciting field of AI, perhaps the most exciting that we have over the last years, but we are still, let's say, some years away from uh, the possibility of transferring knowledge and building uh, AI system uh, directly from natural language specifications. That's my current understanding of the state of the art. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, what do you think about GPT-3, for example? Uh, I, I am in the, the same uh, position of uh, all your researchers like Gary Marcus about that, but uh, some people believe that GPT-3 from OpenAI, it's a yeah, well, this, you know, Fernando, this is very large language models, depending on how much compute power you have uh, at your disposal. Um, I'm being very, uh, let's say, uh, um, I'm oversimplifying here, let's say, the, the argument. Of course, there is a lot of technicalities involved in uh, organizing uh, the data sets, organizing the information, programming everything that's over there. But in the end of the day, what you are seeing with this billion or multi-billion or trillion parameters being processed by uh, large neural networks, uh, what you're seeing in large language models that what, what's most important here is computational power, it's computing power. Uh, we don't have, as the specialists say, I'm not a specialist in natural language processing, by the way, I'm much more in the reasoning side, in logic and so on, 
in neural networks, okay? Uh, but we are seeing in natural language processing is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some strong criticism by people who have been uh, researching the field for a long time that they don't they don't see a semantics underlying the research in uh, large language models. Uh, it's an interesting um, area of research. It's a very, of course, it's an extremely interesting technology when you show to a journalist that uh, an AI can produce a text that is sometimes similar or sometimes better than the text that a journalist can produce that's like gobsmacking to a newspaper manager or to a to an editor of a of a newspaper so that, that that's really impressive but then when you are a specialist and you start to interact with the systems and pose some hard questions you say well after the second or third questions like those simulators that you use to build in ai systems in in prologue after second or third question it kind of gets lost if you are a specialist in natural language processing so we are still not there but i consider um, a natural language and natural language understanding and natural language um, and machine translation one of the most exciting areas that we have in terms of ai technology these days perhaps the most exciting one uh, depending on uh, on your personal taste of uh, science and research i see that renata has a question here renata wasserman let me see if I can understand the question. Perhaps her question is too deep for my for my natural intelligence to understand it. Let's see which which works would you recommend to create a minimum common common ground between researchers from neuro and symbolic background? Oh, okay. Thank you, Renata. Thank you so much. Um, I say the paper that I wrote with Artur in uh, the end of 2020 that revised and in 2021 and submitted is a paper that uh, aimed exactly this audience, Renata. It was not extremely technical. It was not uh, too focused on our own research. It was a paper who tried to give you the general idea or the general uh, underlying principles of neurosymbolic AI. So I would start with that paper that, that has a very uh, simple title called uh, Neurosymbolic AI, the third wave. It's the third wave because the first wave of AI was symbolic, the second wave was uh, connectionist. So we think, and some of the researchers believe that the third wave of artificial intelligence will be an integration of several techniques that can lead to better reasoning and learning systems. So that's why the title of the paper, Neurosymbolic AI, the third wave, perhaps this is the third wave of uh, artificial intelligence. So I would start with that paper. We wrote other survey papers that are more technical in nature, but starting from that one, perhaps it's, it's, it's okay for a non, from a non-specialist. Thank you so much for the, for the question. I hope... I hope the, the Wi-Fi is still on. At least I am listening to myself. So, <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Maybe we are attacked by some anonymous country that didn't like the comment about uh, geo, uh, a fictitious geopolitical case here. So. Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> well, uh, we are going to the final, uh, final of uh, this seminar and uh, if you have some final comments about uh, your presentation or if someone has a, a, a final question uh, so it's time to to conclude our seminar Luis Lam, if you want to say something to... thank you i will uh well thank you so much for the for the invitation uh sometimes i feel fernando that we uh, interact more with people uh, from other countries than among our community. I uh, I think there should be more integration among ourselves. There's a lot of very intelligent people, smart people in Brazil to talk about uh, AI, but uh, we are kind of uh, scattered in the country and we don't meet we don't we don't we don't meet each other. Uh, too frequently. Perhaps we should try and make an exercise in meeting on a more regular basis. We don't have that many people uh, as some other big countries have in, in AI and computing research. Perhaps we, sh perhaps we should make an effort to, to have a better and a more integrated community in Brazil so we would have more, uh, more power, more punch in our uh, in terms of uh, research, in terms of uh, the impact that we have in society. So thank you very much. The work you are doing over there at the, the Center for AI is outstanding. I have great respect and admiration for you and for 
the group. I saw that Claudio was here. Thank you, Claudio, for the prestige of being the audience. Renata, Gerson was here as well, and some other friends too. So uh, I thank you very much, and it, it was it was a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Luis Lam, for your presentation, your words. And uh, I agree totally with you that we need to work in a network. And uh, the C4AI is, is exactly that, to work in uh, uh, making a network of researchers that can exchange ideas in our country, but also with, with other institutions from uh, outside the Brazil and it's very interesting to have this opportunity to invite people like you to talk about uh, some uh, so about this uh, so interesting topic and uh, I would like to say thank you very much for your time yeah, and uh, for your presentation and also to the audience who, for being here to uh, for waiting up to the end, uh, even with uh, some connection problems we, we had this in this presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the support from the people from C4AI, also Mauricio, that uh, was supporting uh, with the presentation and the, the managing the, the transmission. And I hope you have a good final uh, of day and thank you very much we see you in the next presentation that we are organizing a, a next talk that will probably continue this discussion about neurosymbolic systems so thank you everyone and uh, see you in the next uh, seminar thank you Len. bye bye hi